Okay. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming this morning. My name is Brian Melendez, and I chair the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party. And in this election, we're down to the home stretch. With much of the campaign behind us, we're all aware of Tom Emmer's favorite campaign slogan, live within your means. And since Tom Emmer refuses to deviate from his Tea Party rhetoric on his plans for Minnesota and refuses to specifically address the reality of his plans for the state budget, all, Minneso all Minnesotans have to go on are his slogans and the public record. Well, Emmer's slogans and the public record don't match up, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Now, you should all have a copy of this table, which lays out the public information that we found from property records at the Wright County Auditor's Office and the Hennepin County Public Records Division. As you can see, Tom Emmer has taken out seven separate short-term mortgages on his house in Delano and six additional mortgages on his previous home in Hennepin County. Now, clearly, this record of unusual borrowing is a pattern, so let's take a look at the data. At the top, you have the mortgages on the Delano property. He bought the house in 2002 for $425,000 uh, and financed it with a $300,000 mortgage from the State Bank of Loretto with a two-year term. Okay, seems reasonable so far. But within a couple of years of buying the house, he had borrowed on a $425,000 piece of property a total of $857,000. And you can see over the next several years uh, that, that he's borrowed more, paid some back, borrowed more, paid some back. So that when we get to uh, uh, March of 2010, seven and a half years after he bought the house, he has borrowed more than $1.6 million against the house and still owes $527,000 of that amount. Now, I don't know what the appraised value of the house is today. The purchase price in 02 was $425,000. Um, it's possible that the house went up roughly a quarter in value. I don't know the answer to that. But it is interesting that just a couple of years after buying it, he had borrowed almost twice as much as the house was worth at the time he bought it. You also have the information at the bottom of the sheet on the six additional mortgages that we uncovered on the property in Hennepin County. Mr. Emmer has currently not submitted any further information on the status of these loans. Now, any of this stuff taken in isolation might be easily explainable. There may be perfectly good answers for all of this. But taken together, they raise a lot of questions for Mr. Emmer. And here are some of the questions that I would like answers to. Since he hasn't released his tax returns, how was he making the monthly payments on these two-year $300,000 loans? There is no available public record on the status of his loans on the House of Independence. So has he satisfied those loans, or does he in fact still owe more than half a million dollars on a property that, that he purchased for $425,000? Here's a question that, that interests me very much. Two years after he bought the Delano home for $425,000, he owed $857,000 on it, more than twice as much. So why would a bank lend you, Mr. Emmer, why would a bank lend you more than twice what your house was worth? And why would different banks finance your house with multiple mortgages that far exceeded the house's value? And finally, why would still other banks write additional mortgages after he went into foreclosure? Now, I'm not faulting Tom Emmer for using his houses as an ATM. Many Minnesotans have done the same thing. And in these uncertain and tough economic times, I'm not even criticizing him for letting his house get foreclosed on. Unfortunately, too many good Minnesotans have shared that experience too. But I am asking Mr. Emmer, as a candidate for governor, to be more forthright about his personal finances and about his plans for our state's finances. Once again, Minnesotans are left with a lot of questions about Tom Emmer and his plans for the future of Minnesota. Voters deserve to know the truth and the whole story when they go to the polls in 12 days, and we are eagerly awaiting the answers. The average Minnesotan may be no stranger to mortgage debt or even to foreclosure, but Tom Emmer is not an average Minnesotan with one mortgage. He doesn't have just one mortgage, or even two, or three. He has seven, and it's a long trail of short-term mortgages. The average Minnesotan isn't taking high-dollar mortgages over simply, uh, that, are, that are in two years. The average Minnesotan also isn't running for governor, and the average Minnesotan isn't going around the state lecturing about how we all need to manage our finances like a family does. Tom Hemmer is not a regular Minnesotan, and this kind of personal financing is not what average people do. There may be perfectly good answers for everything that's going on here, but Tom Emmer needs to answer some questions about how he runs his own finances before anybody lets him run the states. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions if you all have any. Do you really know how unusual this is? No, it's not unusual for people to have first and second mortgages. Do you know the average amount of mortgages in Minnesota? I, I don't, but I've never heard of anybody having more than two at the same time on a house, or two mortgages and, and uh, uh, you know, maybe a line of credit. Um, I've never heard of seven, but I, I also don't have any statistics to tell you how many of these there are. I, I imagine a banker would know that. Do you have a rough idea or, or precise idea of what the 
interest rates were in the short term loans? Uh, do we know what the interest rates are? I don't think so. No, all we know is what's on the information that's filed with, uh, with the, the uh, recorder's offices in Hennepin and, uh, and, uh, and in Delano. And what's your best theory on explaining the, the uh, discrepancy between the $527,000 in debt and the $1.6 million that was borrowed? How did uh, well, it, it, the, the, the columns, the, the column that says total borrowed is a cumulative total of what he's borrowed. He's paid some of that back. Mm -hmm. So the total debt is what, uh, the total of what he's borrowed minus the total of what he's paid back, which comes out to $527,000 and change. Right. But that means that he paid off about $1.1 Right. Million. Over about a seven-year period. Where do you think he came up with the money? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. As far as I know, his income is from the legislature and from his law practice, but he has not released his tax return, so I don't know where he's getting money. Um, a, a, a lawyer during this period, over seven years, who practices in a small town at a small firm, who makes uh, enough to pay back a million dollars in loans, um, that, that seems a little bit unusual to me, but I honestly don't know. He hasn't released his tax returns. I think he should. Mark Dayton has. So why won't Tom Emmer release his tax returns? But that's the question that I'm asking as well, is where is he getting the money for this? Uh, right. Uh, is the 527, and pardon my ignorance, uh, is the 527, is that interest included? You know, does that, how does that show? Is that just uh, raw dollars? Uh, that's just raw dollars. And again, we're going off the documents that are filed in the county recorder's offices. So all that it's showing is, is uh, that there is a mortgage or a lien being placed on the house. That's and, not and what's owed. 30 years out on correct. a long-term loan or something. Th th that's correct. Uh, and and we, are, we are subtracting amounts that show up in the satisfactions of mortgage or satisfactions of liens that he's filed on that property. So that would not include the, whatever interest he's paid in the meantime. It's just the raw, num the raw numbers that are on file publicly. And you don't know the current value? Isn't that public information, at least the tax? Uh, the assessed tax value would be public information, but that's uh, not always spot on with, uh, uh, you know, with what a bank would tell you the property is worth. Right, and, and we have not looked up the assessed value, no. Brian, this doesn't necessarily mean he's paid off $1.1 in the last eight years. I mean, if you're using debt to pay off debt, aren't you churning the numbers, and doesn't that drive up? And that's possible. We don't know what it means. Um, because he hasn't released any of his financial information. And, and that's what I'm calling on him to do today. This raises some serious questions about he, how he manages his finances. There may be great answers. He may have a thriving law practice and he may have made, you know, three million dollars during that time. We just have no way of knowing. So why won't he answer these questions? But in the meantime, uh, you know, it just strikes me as very odd that a bank would loan somebody twice what his house is worth. I, I don't know about any of you, but my banker won't do that. I, I guess I haven't asked. Have any connection between Emmer and the at the bank or? Um, we do know that uh, there are several different banks involved here. In fact, just looking at this, I can see State Bank of Loretto, Hometown Mortgage, First Commercial, Klein Bank. So at least four banks involved. We do know that one of the, that there was one banker who worked uh, at the first state, or excuse me, at the State Bank of Loretto and later worked at one of the other banks, and I'm not sure which one, who was a contributor to his campaign uh, and who helped him out with at least two of these loans. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know the details of that, but there, you know, there may be some kind of connection with the the personal relationship between this banker and Emmer. Brian, this, this storyline has been circulating in the blogosphere for at least a couple of months. Why are you guys jumping on it now? Uh, it may have been circulating in the blogosphere, but I, I just began hearing about it this week and we actually dug into the records just in the last couple of days. So I, if there's a blogger who had all this data, uh, this, is, this is news to me. But I mean, is it suggestive of any kind of concern on your part that, that you've made up ground on your candidate <laughs> no, uh, no, I think, uh, I, I think whether Mark Dayton was 30 points ahead or 30 points behind, the DFL would be hitting the Republican candidate. Well, whose wealthy has been a big issue in this? Are you trying to assert that Tom Emmer is wealthy, that Tom Emmer is a millionaire? I, I don't know whether he's a millionaire or not. I have no reason to think that he is, but he won't release his personal finances, so nobody knows. And so why is that a taboo topic? The, you know, the DFL candidate who, uh, you know, whose wealth is well known has been very forthcoming about his finances. Uh, my, my point is not that Tom Emmer might be a millionaire. I don't know. My point is that Tom Emmer won't disclose any information about him, his, his personal finances, but he wants to run the states. Are there political risks in releasing something like this now, Brian? Uh, uh, Rudy Perkins waiving the divorce papers. Mark brought that up earlier when there was some mm -hmm. product about his past. 
Are there, are there concerns in that regard? That well, and, impact? Uh, let's be clear. I'm not accusing Tom Emmer of anything. I'm saying, why don't you be forthcoming? Um, and so, I, you know, I think if I, were, if I were waving this around saying he's got a sweetheart deal with his bankers, I'm not saying that. But if I were saying that, I think there would be a political risk. Uh, if I were saying he's, uh, you know, he's hiding something, he's got something to hide, he's doing something wrong, I think that would be a political risk, and that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, this information, which is in the public record, raises a lot of questions. Why won't you answer those questions, Mr. Emmer? And that's the only place I'm going. And I think that's perfectly fair. And if anybody, you know, if anybody think that, thinks that that is uh, politically risky, I, I don't think so. In 2005, you cite a notice of foreclosure. Was he foreclosed on? Was he notified? Can you clarify? What uh, he was notified and foreclosure proceedings began, I believe, uh, and Sam, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe that he took care of it before the foreclosure was affected. So they, they started the process. He got enough money to stop the process. But it, it, it at least got to the point where he was given notice that he was in default and legal proceedings were instituted. Is that? Okay. Do you have any evidence that he cross collateralized? collateralize this house? No, because that, that wouldn't show up in the public record. We would have no way of knowing that. Um, I, I would like to know the answer to that, but I, I don't have any basis to say that that's what happened. Should the legislature pass legislation requiring disclosure of things like this, requiring disclosure of uh, income tax records, for instance? Uh, I, I'm not sure that I would go quite that far. I think the legislature ought to require more disclosure from candidates than we get. Uh, but but in this season, where there are you know there are uh, massive corporate ad buys that are being secretly funded in the race, I'm very much in favor of disclosure. I don't think that secret money ought to be fueling campaigns. And and the less secrecy in in a campaign for an office like governor, the better. The Democrats have been in charge of the legislature for a while. Why haven't they done something that would? Well, the, uh, the, the DFL legislature didn't address this specific issue because it really hadn't come up, but if you recall, uh, uh, Senator Rest and others uh, passed a bill through the legislature this year requiring much greater disclosure of corporate donations to campaigns, and I think that's what they were focused on in light of the Citizens United decision earlier this year. Um, so I, I, I think they will, they will deal with this when they get to it, but this year the need for corporate disclosure of corporate money was much more pressing. Brian, your, your party has had trouble closing the deal elections. Can you just give us an appraisal of a week or two out uh, where you think this race is and then how you, how you uh, get across the finish line mm -hmm. per uh, time and by We've had trouble closing the deal for about two decades now. <laughs> um, you know, uh, m most of the polls, including our internal information, shows Mark Dayton ahead by, by differing amounts. I think that's where we are. Um, unless there is something dramatically game-changing in the next 12 days, I think that Mark Dayton gets elected as our 40th governor on the 2nd of November. Um, our, our plan is to, is to just keep doing business as usual. The, the DFL party itself uh, has one of the best ground games in the state. We've got all our folks deployed. Our folks are excited. We've got the president here on Saturday to, the route to rally the troops. We've got Governor Jim Doyle from Wisconsin here on Sunday. Um, we're just going to keep playing that game. Um, uh, and in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, Mark is getting all around the state. I think there are a few debates left. Uh, if everything stays on course, Mark's going to be elected in 12 days. Did you expect me to say something different? <laughs> <laughs> you said your turn up rolling. Uh, I, I'm not going to say exactly what it is, but it shows Mark ahead. And did you feel any need to, to kind of take this tack because your candidate has uh, been receiving questions on uh, you know, a weekly basis by the by the state other state party? Um, no, not really. Uh, I mean, this, this was something we decided internally at the staff. Um, I, I, this push isn't coming from the Dayton campaign or from anywhere else. We just have some good researchers on the staff, thank you, Sam, um, who, who wanted to dig into this, and they did, and spent some time on it, found something interesting, and we decided that it was worth, uh, it, it was worth airing in public. But no, there, there hasn't been any, uh, any push, and I'm not impelled by anything that the other party is doing to have this press conference. And, and, and by the way, uh, if I were impelled to, to, to follow the tack the other party is doing, um, then I would find something that Tom Ember did in grade school that's already been widely reported and then repeat it. I think this is at least somewhat new information. Does he have any South Dakota trusts? Uh, does, does who? Uh, uh, Mr. Ember. I, I would have no way of knowing. You should ask him that. In fact, you should ask him a number of questions. Anything else? All right, folks, thank you very much.